Okay, we're ready to talk about the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond occurs primarily, I'll go here, when you have a hydrogen covalently bonded to one highly electronegative atom, like let's say like oxygen, doesn't have to be oxygen, but having an affinity for another one. And that hydrogen would like to join with the other molecule. That's what we call a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is only one twentieth the strength of a covalent bond, but their strength in numbers. And just like water itself has a bunch of hydrogen bonds, and when you add them all up, it makes it very strong. It's the bond that holds water and makes it stick together in a bead, or how you can drink from a straw and so forth like that. So in a water molecule, let's take for example, go back and study water, the intra within the molecule, the intramolecular bond are polar covalent. The intramolecular bonds are polar covalent. But the intermolecular bonds between one molecule and the other is a hydrogen. And in this case, you can see this hydrogen is covalently bonded to this oxygen, which is highly electronegative, but it likes this other one too, we'll say. And that's a hydrogen bond. So this molecule is being held by a weak force to this other molecule here. Okay. So we go and we can see here in that drawing and this drawing that force there between. So the hydrogen bonds are holding water molecules together. Hydrogen bonds are holding water molecules together. It's what makes water beat up, shall we say. The von der Waal attractive force is basically, to say it in a simple way and get it out of the way, is this, is that every atom in this universe has some attraction for another atom. Every atom has some. And these forces are very weak, but they call them von der Waals attractive forces. All right. Let's move to another topic real quick. Uh, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic interactions. Okay. These situations look like a bond, but they are not. For example, hydrophobic means to fear water. Hydrophilic means to like it. Let's take hydrophobic. Let's say if I put a bunch of lipids in water. Now let's say I stick lipids and I push it, force them under the water. Let's say the, the lipids, lipid molecules do not necessarily like one another. They're different kinds, but I force them under water. But the key they all share is the desire that they hate the water. So when you place them underwater, what will happen is they will coalesce together. Not because they like each other, but because their hate of water is greater than their neutral feeling about each other. So it looks like a bond when they cluster together, but in fact it's not. Hydrophilic interactions are easy because that's where we could form a solution because things dissolve in, in water there. So hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Next topic to take up real quick, the collision theory. Okay, here's how this works. I named certain criteria that atoms have to do to come together, just like sodium would meet chloride. But what I want to point out real quickly here is this, is that atoms do not just magically find one another. You may have someone that, that you're going to marry, and you've never met them before. But there's no magic that somebody could be pulled from England to America. It just happens if you happen to meet them and bounce into them, and, at the, and also at the right time. Same thing with, with atoms. There's no magic to pull sodium to chloride or anything else. So what atoms bounce around it is something called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is just a, a name for the random motion of atoms and molecules. And our universe will talk about love randomness. Okay, so if the right ones just happen to bounce into one another in the right angulation and orientation, they can form a bond. They can form a bond. Now, how could I increase the chance of the right stuff bouncing in? One is to increase the temperature. So if you increase the temperature, atoms and molecules bounce faster. 
and the other is to increase the concentration of the things that you would like to come together. That would so the likelihood of them colliding will be. The third is to what we call add a catalyst. Add a catalyst. Okay, so we'll go through real quickly. So low concentration, few collisions, high concentration, more collisions of the right stuff. Okay, that's the collision theory if you want to look at it. Okay, the collision theory principles would basically be this. The proper atoms must find one another. The atoms must collide in the right orientation. What it means is atoms bond at a certain angle. So if they bounce into one another and they are not at that bounce in the right orientation, they will just bounce away. They also must have enough velocity to bounce in and lock the bond, let's say. And they must come together in the right chemical environment, like pH, temperature, and everything like that. Okay. So, in, when we get to it, in order to increase the chance of everything happening, because we did say you could increase the concentration, you could increase the temperature, but in the human body, that would be difficult, because in, the body can only tolerate a certain temperature, if you increase the concentration of, let's say, sodium too much, you can cause other problems. So that's where we come in with something later we'll talk about called a catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without being consumed in the reaction. Speeds up a chemical reaction without being consumed in the reaction. In biochemistry, that's what an enzyme is. So we will be discussing that later. So the ways to increase the collision theory would be to increase temperature or increase concentration or add something called a catalyst. All right. Let's go to another subject real quick. Generic chemical reactions. Generic chemical reactions. Okay. We have, we're going to name four, building reactions, breaking down reactions, exchange reactions, and reversible. Please read this in the text and my PowerPoint. Here would be a, a building reaction, A plus B going to AB. This reaction would, could be called a synthesis reaction. However, in biochemistry, it's called an anabolic reaction. So anabolism is a building reaction. Like if someone said anabolic steroids, the muscles would get bigger, let's say. So this is a building reaction, termed a synthesis, but in biochemistry, an anabolic reaction, you can call it, call it if you're using organic molecules in biochemistry. Here's a, here's a building making a protein from something we'll call amino acids when we get into that, okay? Building reaction. Then we have what we call a breaking down reaction, or also called a decomposition reaction. In biochemistry, it's called catabolism, where you take a big thing and you break it down into smaller parts. A catabolic reaction, breaking down reaction. Okay. Here would be a decomp reaction. Here's glycogen, which is a carbohydrate, being broken down into individual glucose molecules. Okay. An exchange reaction would be like this, A plus B, C plus D, going to this here. So what's happening is they exchange in partners. As I showed you a reaction, sodium hydroxide, which is a base combined with hydrochloric acid, could re-exchange its partners and come up with table salt and water. That's what we call an exchange reaction. Okay, here would be another example of exchange reaction. Okay, we go now to one that's a little, little, little more difficult, and that is what we call a reversible reaction. Okay, a reversible reaction can go in both directions. Now, what makes a reaction go in a certain direction? It has to do with the laws of energy that we'll talk about later, the laws of energy. So the laws of energy say, if, for example, if this reaction can only go this way and not come back that way. So the laws of energy determine the, the, the direction of the reaction. Now, just to name it real quick, in this reaction, and I should have named that, on this side are your reactants. Here's your directional arrow, and on this side are what we call the products, the result. So in all of these reactions, here would be on this side would be your reactants, 
And on this side is your product. The product is what you get, and here's the directional arrow to show you what direction the reaction will proceed in. Okay, so we go back to reversible. Notice I have arrows in both directions. Okay, now, in this reversible reaction, we're going to add another component real quick. When I bracket a chemical, that means the concentration of. When I bracket a chemical, that means the concentration. So I'm looking at the concentration of A plus the concentration of B going to a certain concentration of AB. Okay? The way the reaction would go is I would take a certain concentration of A, then a certain concentration of B. The reaction then would start to proceed in this direction. Once the laws of energy jump in, and if this reaction, once it reaches a certain concentration, if the laws of energy are favorable, it will turn it back this way. Now listen to me well. That means you still are bringing some this way, but you're starting to bring some back that way. You still are bringing some this way, so the reaction is reversible. It's going in this direction and that direction at the same time, at the same time. Okay, so a reaction starts with a certain concentration of substances, as I mentioned, so read this. Now, I go back, I'm looking at this rate of reaction, okay, so I go back to this. In this particular situation, when you have the rate going this direction equal to the rate going that direction, listen to me. When you have the rate going this direction equal to the rate going in this direction, remember rates, that's what we call the state of equilibrium. So you have the rate this way and going back that way. Now the key to this, I want you to understand, at equilibrium, the concentrations on both sides are not necessarily the same. It has nothing to do with the concentrations being the same. Equilibrium in a reversible reaction is when the rate in the forward direction equals the rate in reverse. Now, if that is the case, what can we say about concentrations? Whatever the concentrations are, if you're taking one this way, at the same time you're bringing one back that way, that at the state of equilibrium, the concentrations will not change. The concentrations will not change. Now, in chemistry, understand, everything is done at a certain temperature and pressure. So in any experiment, remember, you only want to vary one variable at a time. So on, a re on any reaction, we also, if this was chemistry, would, would state the temperature and pressure. So if a reaction reached equilibrium, but you change the outside parameter of temperature and pressure, it could again reach equilibrium, but at a different value, at a different value. Okay, so study on that. So here again is this. I'm not going to get into the equilibrium constant since I'm not teaching face to face. All right. So I'm going to close this, this video here because our next subject is going to be counting atoms and molecules. Thank you.